Okay, wonderful. So this is super exciting to give uh, talk to an audience that I think will understand almost exactly where I'm coming from, and we can skip all the most of the preliminaries. But please, you know, I, I want to make sure everyone understands everything here. So tell me if I'm skipping over something. And I'm basically going to tell you <coughs> about my foray back beyond the Oceanity into more general SDEs, and then to uh, end it with a little bit of talking about stochastic PDEs, which I still don't really understand. OK. And I, I think you guys are going to really love this, this model class. So the motivation for almost all of the stuff I've been talking about lately is irregularly sampled data that often comes up in like sort of real business -y applications. Here is a bit of data from the Mimic data set of one person in an intensive care unit for, I think, 48 hours. And then these are different types of measurements that could be made at different times. And the point is, uh, it's not just that the times are irregular, but also which thing is being measured at each time. It can vary. So doctors and nurses are coming and going, making all sorts of measurements. And then this is data, real data from a application of latent SDEs, or like maybe the first real one, which is the brightness of some black holes in the middle of galaxies far away, where they, this is over years. And the point is, they only get to take a measurement every few days, and it depends on what's going on with like the weather and which way the planets are facing or whatever. Um, and so I really want to make sure we're handling, handling this data natively, so we're sort of squeezing every ounce of information out of it. Um, and so, of course, I think everyone here would say, well, that's why you need a latent variable model, a generative model, um, such that there's some latent variable that updates um, according to some, well, transition dynamics, and this being a generative model, if there happens to be any missing observations, we get to marginalize them up for free. Um, of course, then we have to do approximate inference. So the discrete time version of, of something I think very sensible, and I think you guys might agree, is something like deep Markov models by David Sontag. So this is just kind of making sure we're all on the same page notationally. Um, and one thing that I always emphasize, which I think you guys would totally appreciate, is that this likelihood does not have to be Gaussian. It could be anything. It could be a language model. Like we can imagine having doctor's notes just at a particular instant in time and saying, oh, well, as long as my uh, likelihood of text depends on my latent variable, there's actually no problem in having completely crazy likelihoods and all sorts of complicated, discrete observations. OK, so the first crack that we took at moving this kind of latent variable, latent variable model to continuous time was latent ODEs. Um, because I didn't understand anything about SDEs um, back in 2017, 2018, where we said, okay, it's actually totally fine to put an ODE solver into your model and differentiate through it. Um, maybe that seems totally obvious now. It seemed like it, totally, it wasn't completely obvious in 2018 to everybody. Um, and so the first thing we might do is say, okay, at time zero, there's an unknown initial state of our patient or our business or whatever, and some dynamics F. <laughs> Uh, such that the state evolves instantaneously according to those deterministically given the state. Um, and then at some different times, we might see some uh, data. And if there's times where we don't see data, again, that marginalizes out for free, so no problem. So this is very key. And then, of course, you could say this is just a really complicated likelihood for this single latent variable Z of time zero. And so what we did was we said, okay, well, do inference in this, like it's a VAE. Um, and so the only awkward part is that your encoder has to set, somehow slurp up this entire time series to condition on it to give you your approximate posterior over Z at time zero. Sorry, just to check. So F is known here. So here F is going to be just some neural network or some black box function that goes from the size of Z to sort of the tangent space of Z. And it has some parameters data that we'll likely be learning jointly while we do our approximate inference. Yeah. So the, yeah, the idea is that we start with our data, and this is maybe the latent state represents yeah, someone's health trajectory throughout their stay in a hospital or something. Um, and we're going to learn the dynamics of human physiology while we also learn the likelihoods and how to do approximate inference. Any other questions so far? Anyone have a problem with this model? I think maybe so X here is a bit observation. Yeah, exactly. X is, yeah, all those crazy observations we saw before, or again, could be doctor's notes, who knows what. You know, that's sort of a orthogonal component to this whole thing is having interesting likelihoods. That's 
we, we have gradients everywhere, so we can do whatever we want. Yes. Is this continuous time? Yes, this is the, the, the screen now is we have continuous time and the updates are sort of like infinitesimal. Yeah. So you don't have any interventions at the moment or control parameters, but it's, as long as they're fixed, it doesn't matter. Exactly. So you uh, anticipated the, or that's the objection I was hoping you would make, which is that this is a really weird model because the patient's entire state for the rest of their life is determined by their initial state. So if they get hit by a car or something when they're 20, it has to be like foretold in their initial state. Um, and also that would be like a huge instantaneous or almost instantaneous change. Um, so we don't, if we, if we have these deterministic dynamics, we have to cram all of the information about this patient into this initial state. So that's where, oh yeah. And so just to show you a proof of concepts to make sure it's clear that we can jointly learn everything. Here's a toy experiment where uh, here are three different trajectories um, where we have noisy observations in one dimension uh, of the latent state. So here the observations are one dimensional, it's X. The latent state is, I think, four dimensional in this example. Um, and th this is at the beginning of training. The, there's a terrible fit, there's no uh, match to the data. Here are, the, here are three of the latent dimensions. I guess, sorry, it was three dimensions. Here is this a, a two-dimensional slice of that f function that maps from the current state to what is the dynamics. And uh, this is samples from the prior. So if we example z0, um, and then this is showing the, the mean over observations. So nothing fits, but as we all know now, stochastic gradient descent on an elbow is this incredibly powerful thing that sort of just works um, with a little bit of fiddling. Right, and so maybe unsurprising to most of you that that's fine. And so uh, again, maximizing the standard variational elbow, we can learn the latent dynamics, which are kind of like um, cyclical. And the likelihood is very simple here. It's just the Gaussian um, and the, that, yeah, the dynamics here lead to this kind of cyclical behavior. So this is a sort of a baby model um, and it, it roughly works. And it has this major caveat that everything is deterministic. Any questions so far? Okay, quick. Um, and so, I mean, there are benefits to moving to continuous time and having generative models. And so on this mimic data set, we you know, beat everyone else. I wanna mention like for the sake of practicality, you should always start with just an, a recurrent neural network that also gets to observe the time since the last observation. This is sort of in principle, also sorts up all the data in its native format. Um, and it just isn't using Bayes' rule to condition, so it has to learn more parameters, so it's more prone to overfitting. And it's not a generative model, so you can't answer as many queries with it. But like, I'm gonna say, this is probably almost always the first thing you should try if you're interested in prediction as a baseline. Um, and we, there's like various flavors of, uh, you know, trying to ways you can make the recurrent neural network continuous time, and it doesn't really matter very much. Um, Okay, so, oh, one thing I want to mention is that you can also condition on the fact that an observation was made at a certain time with a Poisson process likelihood. Um, so you can have a, not just the probability of what the observation is, but the probability of an observation being made at a certain time. Um, normally we don't use Poisson process likelihoods because you have to solve an integral to sort of evaluate their normalizing constant, but we're, we're solving one of these integrals through time anyways, when we're uh, evaluating our ODE state. So it's just one more dimension to pack onto this ODE and we get what's on process likely it's for free. But in this example, it didn't help very much, maybe because it's just observations being made all the time. Um, and I, okay, this is actually a slide that I think probably I can skip for this audience because you guys all agree that the hidden state of an RNN is not the same thing as a latent variable in a latent variable model or a posterior over latent variables, at least not in any sort of logical way. But I think any, any discerning consumer of machine learning techniques should ask, why not just use an, an RNN? And I'd say the basic, my basic argument for why we shouldn't use RNNs is that they don't have to use Bayes' rule to update their beliefs. They have to learn both the likelihood of observations and how to update their um, beliefs from data from scratch. Um, and then this is makes them more prone to overfit. 
but crucially, it also makes them less uh, or like more robust to model this specification. So this is actually like a huge advantage to RNNs. So you don't really have to think very much about the likelihood over the prior, um, as long as you have enough data. So just trying, I'm trying to like not drink my own Kool-Aid, right? So this is- Could you, sorry, could you extend the very first point again? Yes. Yeah. So when I run a neural network or a recurrent neural network onto data, it's like conditioning on every observation and updating this if size vector. And um, that is a, represents an entire state of belief about the state of the world. But it's different than that Z variable, which is the actual state of the world. So this is kind of like a scrambled version of a proximate posterior, but there's no easy way to read it. So the analogy I like to give is if I'm watching a baseball game, um, there's the actual state of the baseball game. And if I'm watching it, you could like scan my brain and maybe somehow rasterize the activation of all my neurons into a huge vector, that would be the H. And maybe I don't know everything that's happening. I can't you know, see what's the state of mind of the players and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is more like if you have some particular observer watching and a particular representation of beliefs all scrambled up, that's what this H would be. So it's much, that's why it's much less interpretable than our Z. Okay. Yeah, and it mixes up like state and uncertainty about state all together in just one sort of flat representation. Cool. Okay, so as we mentioned, we don't like the determinist, like the, term, the deterministic dynamics is the major limitation of this latent ODE thing, I would say. Um, so what if we wanted to add stochastic transition dynamics like the, the common filters have? So these, you know, we got a random variable condition on the previous time step at every uh, or sorry, the previous state at every time step. Uh, what if we could take a, um, you know, some add noise to an ODE um, and take the infinitesimal limit? Um, and this is exactly what stochastic differential equations do. And I found them to be scary and confusing. And until I kind of made this connection that um, they are really just literally. Okay, so we used to have this ODE in the latent ODE model, um, and we want to add noise to it. So let's bring DT up here, and we still have just the ODE. And then we have our epsilon here, which is just um, IID Gaussian noise, scaled by some sigma that also depends on the state. That just says how much noise we add. And then the only scary part is just that we can't just write a little epsilon independently for each time step um, because as we take the infinitesimal limit, we need the noise to sort of stay independent and it's not really clear how to do that. So the, the little bit of bookkeeping, bookkeeping that we need is to say, let's take a uh, Brownian motion, which is an integrated white noise, and then take differences in time between those. And that's a recipe for giving me uh, white noise at any time scale. And now all my limits make sense and they don't ever end up with something like my noise going to zero accidentally. Okay, and so this, just like the Gaussian process, defines a distribution over functions, but in a way that I don't have access to the joint probability. So that's our big, that's our first major loss compared to GPs is we've lost our closed form likelihoods over um, you know, functions. But yeah, once I specify my initial starting point, let's that can be deterministic without loss of generality, like my state at time zero. Um, once I specify my drift and my diffusion, uh, I now have specified a joint distribution over function values everywhere. And just to make this a little more concrete, the drift function here is showing shown by some these little gray arrows. And so at every point we say, okay, where do we want to send the function? And then at every time step, we're adding a little bit of noise. And so these purple lines are some trajectories drawn from a particular STD with this drift function. And it actually has fixed noise here. So one thing you might say, one thing you might worry about of this formulation is if I have fixed noise, um, does that mean that I'm somehow limited in my marginals being like, um, like spread out? And that's not the case. So I can, um, even if I have fixed noise, I can sort of steer my drift to sort of squish the mass as tightly as I want. So I can have arbitrarily tight marginals, even having a fixed amount of fusion. 
Okay. And so maybe it's not clear. Like there was a few papers that came out around 2018, 2019 that just kind of like stuck noise into an ODE somewhere in a way that didn't make sense. And infinitesimally, this is the standard formulation of SEs from the 50s. I'm not trying to like properly reinvent any of that. It turns out those, those formulations are really good. Um, maybe this is a little bit overkill to say like, what are SEs good for? But they're good for when there's many small unobserved interactions or interventions. If we know what the interventions are, we can just add them to the ODE formulation and we don't really need to uh, do anything special. We just like update the state when we, if we know every time that they were hit by a car or given an, an injection. By, by intervention, you, you mean like you're just conditioning on something on, on a, an observation or is it on the late? To, uh, is it more to it than that? If we had an observation that we knew changed the state instantaneously, that would be something we could add to the ODE framework as long as there were sort of like finite, finitely many of them and we observed all of them. If we try to add more and more of them um, and we imagine they're smaller and smaller, then uh, we could still just integrate out some finitely many unknown, like unknown finitely many interventions in an ODE setting, but it would be pretty annoying. So I'm making the argument that let's do what people normally do, which is just take the limits to infinitely many, infinitely small interaction or interventions. And that's like a pretty good approximation, even if you think there are only finitely many finally large interventions. One thing I'm going to talk about at the very end of this talk is that I'm now working on generalizing this to having jumps as well. And there's actually no technical reason why you can't. Well, the gradients are a little bit annoying when you do that. But what do you mean by jump jumps? Uh, like instantaneous jumps. So the idea is that uh, every this, this form of SDE has always continuous paths. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but like sometimes lots of finance people say, well, let's also allow there to be this extra part, like this levy process that can jump instantaneously. Hmm. Anyway, and maybe this isn't a big complaint to you guys, but some people say, well, why are you restricting yourself to Gaussian noise? Like, I thought the whole thing is we're sticking a million powders into everything and being fully, like, learned. And the nice thing is that it actually doesn't matter, like, any limit of infinitesimally small shocks, no matter what their distribution is. Uh, like, it could be Bernoulli or whatever. It's going to turn into Gaussian instantaneously. So this is kind of nice because we don't actually have to parameterize this noise distribution. It's already, this is sort of like already universal in a sense. Cool. And of course, the original Brownian motion was actually just watching little uh, pollen particles be hit by water molecules. Um, and Brown, Brown was trying to figure out what was going on with that. Um, okay, so now we're going to have the ultimate model that we want to have, which is that we'll have continuous time um, latent variable model. Um, and so this still could be like an ODE, except we get to also have this Brownian motion. Um, and again, we have the classical problem of GPs not fitting in graphical model notation very well. This is the entire function of Brownian motion, setting with the noises instantaneously for every time step. Like maybe I could have written like a little, a bunch of little independent Gaussians here or something, right? Um, do you guys have any suggestions? I'm all ears. Um, right, and so the, but the point is we have this random part and then we have a likelihood again, could be anything you want that's sort of independent. Um, and now the cool thing about this is how nicely the approximate inference works out, right? So it's, <laughs> it's easy to write down a model, right? That's sort of like the easy part. The hard part is how to do approximate inference. And the unsatisfying part is when you just realize, okay, I could use a Gaussian or a mixture of Gaussians or a normalizing flow or whatever series of more complicated approaches and spend a lot of time thinking about it and trading off um, complexity versus fit. And the beautiful thing about SDEs is that there's this universal family of approximate posteriors that I can't exactly prove to my own satisfaction, but I've demonstrated to my own satisfaction that for most likelihoods, this family of approximate posteriors contains the true posterior, or at least can get arbitrarily close. And I'm very embarrassed that I haven't been able to make that precise. I'm not a measure theorist, um, and I should probably collaborate with one to see in which sense that's true. But if I have some prior and some likelihood, my claim, my conjecture is that um, parameterizing an approximate posterior by another SDE that shares the same noise, but has a different drift uh, can 
fits any approximate posterior, like for any likelihood, just by choosing different parameters for this drift. So the idea is that uh, this is going to this posterior drift will be some big neural network that we learn, and when we do variational inference, we learn its parameters. The prior we could learn it as well, or it could just be something from physics. It doesn't really matter. The point is these these two don't have to have the same form. Surprisingly, the noise has to have the same form. It has to be the exact same uh, scale of noise, or the KL is already infinite before you even start. And you might think that's a major limitation, but as I said previously, um, you can actually make the marginals do whatever you want, no matter how big the noise is. So it actually doesn't, this is actually not the limitation that it seems like it is. Okay, so this is maybe a little abstract, so let's come back to this. Um, but there are certainly some limitations for this, uh, the G function, right? So, oh, I mean, in terms of like being Lipschitz and like continuous in Z and stuff like that, yes. Um, I mean, even like in terms of exclusivity, what they actually F I can do. Sure, I guess. So, my claim is that uh, the knob you have to turn is just how big to make this neural network. Mm. And that trades off this sort of slowness of approximate inference against the expressiveness of your approximate posterior. Okay. Yeah. So I, maybe my claim was a little bit hyperbolic before when I said there's this annoying hierarchy of different approximations you have to choose. Hmm. Um, I guess I'll say we don't have to parameterize a density. We only have to parameterize a neural network. And I'm claiming it's sort of more fun and easy to play around with neural network architectures and sizes of hidden layers than it is to change the parameterization of your density. Maybe not by much, but I do think it is an advantage of this approach. Yeah. Okay, so next I'm going to show you what this looks like and then talk about the elbow a bit more, and then we'll be through the main like technical chunk of this talk. So here is a really simple example. Um, let's imagine a Gaussian process prior, orange band balloon deck, Non-Gaussian likelihood, Laplace. Um, and so here, the dots here are just the uh, locations of some data observations with little Laplace likelihoods. The, this is showing the, and then these gray arrows are showing the prior dynamics. So an OU wants to go back to the mean and then adds noise. And then the, these uh, purple things are samples from the prior. And the blue is showing the marginal density of, of the prior. Okay, and so now we're going to, to, to do approximate inference in this. We're going to write down the elbow, which I'll show you in a second, and optimize the drift parameters to maximize that elbow. And it's going to do the nice uh, Bayesian thing, which is you know, to be certain where their data is and to be uncertain where the data isn't. And it's kind of cool. We can see that just by steering these trajectories around, we get a nice approximate posterior. And to me, the really cool thing is um, the fact that the likelihood was non-Gaussian doesn't change anything about the whole inference procedure. So again, I could plug in any crazy thing as long as it's differentiable with respect to the, the state of the process, and it would, I wouldn't have to change any of my other code. Yeah, so this is a non-Gaussian process posterior. I don't know much about what, what, what we can't, I can't say much about it, except I can sample from it, and I can you know, estimate its marginals, stuff like that. So again, we're losing a lot of closed form stuff that we normally have in GPs, like expectations. We have to use simple Monte Carlo to inspect the posterior. Um, yeah, so any questions about this simple example? So if you go back like in the, the beginning of the video, video so on, oh, on, yeah. on the left, you, you like sure. this, this wide region, why is it happening? Like, Oh, well, we also can choose a initial distribution, like a state, uh, sorry, distribution for the initial state if we want. I said before that we can make it just be fixed at a point, mm -hmm. but then of course it doesn't really, it's not hard to just also be uncertain about the initial state. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so um, so what is the, the KL look like, or the elbow? So I said we have this prior and this approximate posterior. Uh, we have a likelihood, so that's just, you know, the Laplace thing to be anything. And then the, um, KL divergence ends up being this integral uh, over the trajectory sampled from the approximate posterior dynamics of the instantaneous difference between the drift divided by the diffusion squared. 
So this just looks like the KL between two Gaussians, basically. Like the, this is the means of the change, and then this is the uh, variance of the noise squared. So this makes a lot of sense because we're basically at every step we conditionally have a Gaussian for the next instantaneous step, and so we're just asking how much do we change. And it's the last, or like one of the wonderful things about this whole setup is that our it's like the trajectories we're sampling from are from the approximate posterior. Um, and the reason this is nice is because if my prior is something very expensive to simulate, um, I might still be able to restrict my family of approximate posteriors to be something that's cheap to simulate. And this term is going to try to make them be similar, to the extent that they can be. Um, but I never actually have to solve the true expensive dynamics to estimate my KL and do approximate inference and fit everything. And, and the thing is that like this integral might seem annoying, but I'm already having to integrate uh, the state forward in time. So again, adding this little KL accumulator is just another one extra real valued state that I have to add to my SDE integrator. Cool, any questions so far? And then, yeah, so here's just like a, a concrete example that a student made a few weeks ago, which is, again, here's some data that I've um, observed. Um, and then we, the orange is the prior marginals and the blue is the posterior marginals. And then here I'm showing what is that instantaneous KL thing. And the kind of nice thing is that it's actually only, and only uh, there is only much instantaneous KL um, right around the data. And in fact, a claim I have that I haven't proven formally, but it seems pretty obvious, is that for the optimal posterior, which we don't have exactly because we're just like running our optimizer, this KL should actually drop right to zero exactly after the last observation for a while. And then like before approaching data, we kind of have to like steer towards the next data point that we're going to hit. So there's going to be some KL that accumulates. But after we see the last data point for a while, um, we like we obviously want to minimize our KL. So if we just set these to be equal, then the instantaneous KL will be zero, and we'll just drift back to the you know prior marginal mixing as is as the optimal posterior would. But this is really cool because um, like when we actually were running these experiments, we were like training this part of the dynamics too because we didn't realize this. But now that we thought about it a little bit more. Everything after the last data point, we know it should just be exactly the, the prior dynamics. That's kind of cool. I mean, GPs obviously have this property too that away from the data, you don't have to think about anything. So here it's again a little bit weaker version of the same property that when there's data around within mixing distance coming up, you can't, you don't have exact zero KL, but afterwards you can kind of forget everything you saw. Cool. Um, and yeah, and so like this is like in 2020. We fit a, a you know ten thousand dimensional or ten thousand parameter SDE, which of course is like complete like table stakes like babies versus machine learning, but in the SDE world this was like a bananas giant model and everyone was just using forward mode differentiation and they were fitting like four parameters or like ten it was like, I mean of course people would discretize time and then fit their giant deep column filters with like a million parameters, but this was like it really hadn't been done in the SDE labs um, surprisingly. Okay, so that's the main technical chunk of this talk. What do you, like, any questions about latent, or SDEs as a model class so far? I have one potentially very stupid. Can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah. So you're talking, yeah, here, you're talking, yeah, post the data. Mm -hmm. You can just let the, the F, the posterior F, just be the prior F. Yeah. So the reason why we're not having the fitting in these sort of scenarios is because it's all done with the elbow and we've got a Bayesian thing. But it feels like I don't know if if, if things are too overly flexible. Be these these functions. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say we can definitely overfit the prior to the data, but just like normal variational inference, the more flexible you are and the better your optimization is, the tighter your elbow will be, and that's sort of only a good thing if you believe your model. But these these Fs could be anything, right? These are just neural networks, or exactly. Okay, I think I'm still thinking in GP world a little bit. So yeah, so the, these could be like disjoint, like the the function itself can, can jump around and yeah, and it can depend on time, or like it should depend on time um, as well. Okay, but surely it's really difficult to learn. Or is yeah. that kind of the point? 
Well, I don't know. That's not the point. I'm sad that it's like this whole thing is slow. And um, if we want to do it, so here I'm just doing sort of normal variational inference where I uh, run from left to right with a certain phi and then the gradients and just optimize phi. But where things get really hairy is when you want to do variational autoencoder where you slurp up all the data and then have a hyper network that outputs a phi for that particular trajectory. And so this is just annoying because now I have an RNN that has to like serve up the data and not forget anything too far back and bottleneck that somehow and put it, have a hyper network that outputs the parameters of another network. So basically the encoder story is a big mess. And like, that's sort of just an engineering challenge that I don't have any great answers for. Um, but like, there's like people writing papers about it now. I think it's one of these things will just get better with time. But the, the, can you go back a couple more slides as well? Sorry, I, I don't really know much about SDEs. I'm going to slow down. Yeah, exactly. Asking stupid questions. But, yes, so the, the prior is, is over the process. So there's no sort of prior over the, the, the actual function you're learning, like, like the, the F itself. Well, I mean, I mean, it kind of is. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, talking, I'm doing sort of point estimates for the F here. We could, of course, wrap another layer of Bayesian in this. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. And I guess that's, that's kind of linked to this overfitting thing. Yeah. But if you if you thought those dynamics were kind of smooth, or, is is that even the case that a smooth f corresponds in any way to kind of smooth smooth dynamics or uh, not necessarily? No, because all the trajectories are um, well. At least if you have a non-zero sigma, all the trajectories are non-differentiable everywhere. Yeah. You can uh, like have states that depend on each other and have zero sigma. And then you sort of have ODEs that are conditioned on SDEs. So you, you can have arbitrarily smooth um, function draws. Like the family of GPs, uh, okay, not all GPs can be expressed this way, but basically everything that we normally do that has like smooth things like, um, let's say, Matern kernel or whatever can be written uh, in some hairy state space representation. One thing I'll say is like, if you think of GP, the kernel, hyperparameters, that, that's these. So if we just have point estimates for the data, we're being as Bayesian as when we make point estimates of our kernel hyperparameters. Cool, yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you for asking, yeah. All right, so that was a lot of uh, math. Now let's just talk a bit more about sort of fun stuff. So I actually didn't write any application papers about this stuff myself. We just sort of put it out there with some PyTorch software and then um, some people at the Flatiron Institute in Stanford applied it to yeah, these sort of brightness trajectories of black holes. And they have some idea, some prior physics model of what's going on with these black holes, where there's some latent variables, like what is the size of the uh, black hole and stuff that don't change with time, but then they need to integrate over the trajectories condition on these sort of global latent variables. And so they are at the stage of like, um, doing simulated data um, versions of these where they have to, like, like that's the problem with science, right? It's like, you don't know what the answer should be. So basically all the work is in the sanity checking and simulation ahead of time. But the point is that like, when they know what the true crowded values are, then their posteriors are pretty much centered around the true values, which is roughly what you want. Cool. So yeah, so this is, I think the killer app of this uh, family of models as it stands is when you have like, let's say hundreds, like tens to hundreds of observations, they regularly sample through time with interesting likelihoods. Yeah, which I think shows up in like businessy and health applications a lot, uh, but I haven't sat down and like done the work to actually get this stuff running. Okay, and then this was like the, the fun application. And actually, I remember walking down the halls of the CBL in like 2012 and thinking like, what, should, like, what would be a good idea? Like, what would impress Carl? And uh, <laughs> I know, if we had an infinitely deep neural network, that would be like, really like, you know, something cool. And then you could be impressed. I always easily impressed. And so like, you know, there's this whole story of like, oh, you can view ODEs like as kind of infinitely deep neural networks. Um, and then it turned out that like, probably if you're interested in doing deep learning with something that's sort of like adaptive implicit compute, you should probably use deep equilibrium models, like Zico Coulter's way of saying, find fixed points instead of the solutions to ODBs. So I think that whole story of like, uh, you know, using neural ODEs for deep learning or for, for, for supervised learning is kind of obsolete and we should just use deep equilibrium models. But 
there was one cool follow-up, which is to say, uh, we can also build an intimately deep Bayesian neural network um, that has their sort of sensible posteriors. Like Bradford Neal was doing this in like 1992 with like stacking like deep GPs, but it was hard to do that in like a sensible way that didn't just kind of um, lead to some like, like forgetting the input basically. Um, so we can also just say, okay, what if our weights uh, at every layer follow, follow an OU process and we only have a layer at the very final time that's like the output of our neural network, um, then we can again do the same thing where we have an approximate posterior on weights with its own variational parameters. Um, and so we basically get this one giant SDE that when we integrate it forward in time, that's sort of going from the bottom of the network to the output, or the input of the network to the output. Um, and yeah, the, the weights are this like non-differential thing, but the activations are smooth because they're integrating over the weights times the current activations. Um, and like, you might say, well, why are we doing this? Um, yeah, and so like, okay, when we fit in, I don't think you'll be that surprised that, uh, you know, the marginal likelihood does roughly the right thing. And after a little while, um, matches some data. Let's see. Yeah, it, it, and this is all very slow, right? The reason you shouldn't use latent SDEs is because every time you want to even estimate the marginal likelihood, you have to run this SDE solver. Um, but the beautiful thing about moving to continuous time is that we have this, uh, we have adaptive SDE solvers, which are not as mature as adaptive ODE solvers, and they're slower, but they have a tolerance that you can tune at test time to say, how, uh, how much error do I tolerate in my output? Um, versus how they, and then if I let there be looser tolerances, everything will run faster. So here we've trained a Bayesian neural network uh, very slowly and expensively. And now at test time, where we can just uh, loosen the tolerance of our solver and explore this Predo front of sort of uh, speed. So this is faster. And classification error, which is, uh, I guess, worse in this direction. Right. So when we trained, we were at this level of um, tolerance, and then the point is that we can like making it tighter doesn't really help because it doesn't. It's not used to like using all that compute, but making it looser, you can actually speed things up a bunch before you really pay a penalty in terms of accuracy. So that's one nice thing. Um, <laughs> it's like so. It's like hey, there's no like cubic scaling anywhere because there's no Gaussians. There's all just but it's like there's this hidden complexity term that we don't even know what it is. So it's like, oh, you can't be mad at me for being slow because I don't even know how slow I am. Right? Um, so that, that's the cost of the, the SDE solver. Exactly. You don't know the complexity. Is that just the adaptive one? Or? Yeah, exactly. If you have a fixed one, then you know that it's like, I'm going to take T steps to get from uh, the start to the end. But then you don't know how much, uh, like how faithfully you're actually following the dynamics that you're parameterizing. So what exactly does adaptive mean in, in this setting? Uh, adaptive means that I say, I, uh, whatever the units of your output are, I say, I'm, I want to allow you, you know, 0.1 units of error on the output. And then there's, um, when the algorithm is choosing to take a step, it notices like, uh, basically locally, like how much error do I think I'm accumulating? It sort of like double checks it, like does a rollout at sort of half resolution and the normal resolution and says, oh, is the error there big? Um, then probably I'm accumulating a lot of error. I should probably like shrink my step size. So it's smart Raj Kupta, something like uh... Yeah, exactly. Although I will say like the state of adaptive SDE solvers is like stone ages compared to the state of adaptive ODE solvers. So this is a more like, hey, SDE solver guys, you should make better SDE solvers because I now here's a reason why something that can take advantage of them. Hmm. Yeah. Um the there aren't really like that strong guarantees on these adaptive SD solvers or, or yeah, I mean I would say the same thing is also true of ODE solvers. Okay. I think their guarantees have been oversold as well. Um, but it's sort of I don't really expect there to be any adaptive compute thing that has really great guarantees. Like maybe the fixed point stuff. But I guess again I'll say that's sort of the numerical guy's job. Uh, mm. to come up with better guarantees. Yes. If you don't know the scaling, do you know that it's always like putable? Does it always terminate? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, could we encode the decision problem in an SDE? I think you probably could. I think it might not be Lipschitz. Yeah, so that's a great point. And I guess I'll say things do just get 
I think arbitrarily expensive to compute as your approximate posterior gets richer. Um, but think, one of the things I'm going to come back to is that we can also encourage the posterior dynamics to be easy to solve. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, okay, so why do I like this model class beyond what I just said? Um, so to answer your objection there, which is, uh, in principle, I don't know how to do this yet, we can tune the dynamics to be easy to solve. And we've done this in ODEs. And the basic idea is to look at the thing that causes high error in whatever ODE solver you're using. So for instance, in a Runge-Kuda solver, the magnitude, so if I have a kth order, like let's say a fourth order Runge-Kuda solver, the uh, fifth total derivative is the thing that's going to be really causing you to accumulate error. So at training time, we can just compute what that is exactly, uh, sum it over our whole trajectory, and say, OK, now adjust, adjust the parameters to make that smaller. Right? So we just add a, loss, a regularization term that says have small fifth order derivatives and higher. Um, and so here's an example of training a neural ODE for supervised learning, where here's the input. There's some desired outputs that we're, we have to match. And with unregularized training, we end up with all these like sort of unnecessary curves going from our input to our output. And the red here is showing regions of high fifth order derivatives, like high curvature, basically. And the dots are showing where the ODE solver took steps. And the point is that when there's lots of curves, we have lots of steps. And when things are straighter, we have bigger space between the steps. So now we turn on this regularizer and train a little bit more. And everything just smooths out, and all the red bits go away, and the number of steps reduces. So this is very, this makes things even slower at training time. But it means that at test time, we are sort of like really only using the compute we need in a sense. For supervised learning, it's like pretty hard to do, get this to be actually faster than just like choosing a fixed depth or whatever by hyperparameters. But in principle, you can imagine for some parts of the space needing a lot of salt, and for some other parts of the space, everything being very smooth. So we might be able to be fast on the simple instances and slow on the expensive instances in principle. So it's, it's possible that you could learn. So this is all about the Zs, right? The different, the, the idea is the Zs are on a smooth path. Is yeah, and the latent face and the paths of the Zs are determined by the app. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this, these statistics are deterministic functions of the F. So it's, you're forcing yourself to learn a smooth mapping, where you could learn a not smooth one because you've got maybe a lot of parameterization in the Zs. Exactly. But it's easier to learn, but then, well, kind of easier to pin down, but then harder to actually do the, the, the inference on. Exactly. Kind of a weird concept, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And there, so I think there's an analogous set of regularizers for SDEs that I haven't really thought too hard about yet. And it, again, it depends on what the solver strategy is. Like they might have different uh, strategies that are sensitive to different forms of complexity. Right. So anyway, that's uh, in principle, we can at test time make them easy to solve. And again, that's especially important for the latent SDE formulation because we only have to draw trajectories from the approximate posterior. We can force it to be easy to, or we can encourage it to be easy to integrate. It feels a bit weird, like because we're we are in a we're in a Bayesian sort of setting, and then you're adding this regularization in, kind of weird. And maybe it's it's more natural than than the way you presented it there, but to me, it seems like you're kind of adding that in. Could you not kind of encode in your prior somehow about the dynamics? Well, I say the prior is like sacred in the sense of like it could be coming from physics or something, and the approximate posterior is just. You know, whatever engineering crazy crap we need to make things work, to make the elbow tight, basically, and to make it practical. Those are the two things we need from the elbow. So I would say it's sort of sacrilegious to mess with the prior, um, just to make things fast and uh, good fits. Okay. So I was thinking about the Zs as like the true underlying, sort of, and that's not the right way to think about them then. Well, no, I, I would say that like the, the prior does talk about Zs, and so... The problem is that we need to come up with this other thing, the approximate posterior, that's going to let us answer queries about joint distributions over Zs condition on data. And so in a sense, there's nothing sacred about the approximate posterior. It's just whatever we could get to run on our computers. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But we should always, like, the, the point is, if we make our approximate posterior bigger and we have bigger computers, we won't, or if we have bigger, let's see, if we have bigger computers, we won't need this regularization as much. Um, but if you have a small computer, you'll need a lot of it. But there's no way around that, basically, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. 
so if anyone wants to chat with me about like adaptive SDE coupling and what would be a good analog in the SDE setting, I would love to chat about that. Oh, and again, here's this nice um, reader front showing that like you can really play around with the um, the solver, um, or sorry, the amount of regularization a lot before you pay a big price. And in this setting, it, like it actually helped a little bit to turn up the regularization. I actually forget if this is test or train loss though. So okay. Oh yeah, and like here's an example of what you're maybe worried about is um, maybe it completely changes the answer to, tr to turn on this regularization. So to try to give a feeling for that, here is a um, a latent ODE dynamics that we learn unregularized, and then we turn on the regularization. And uh, I had a quantification for how bad, how much we lost there. It was anyway. It was something like eighty percent. Uh, it was something like four times faster, and like we lost like twenty percent accuracy. So something along those magnitudes is like you wouldn't want to lose that accuracy, but it also gave you a huge amount of speed up. And the dynamics kind of still point in roughly the same direction even after we turn on the regularization. In this one, for example. Cool. Okay, and now this is where everything really uh, merges together, which is that um, it turns out that there's a way to adjust gradient estimators for the elbow, such that if you get close to the, as you get closer to the true posterior, the variance in your gradients goes to zero. And so here's an example in one dimension from a NIPS paper um, that I was on in 2017 of just doing variational inference on a mixture of Gaussians. And this is like the standard, if you just do back through the elbow, um, you just kind of wiggle around the optimum, just like SGD normally does, right? If you don't decay the learning rate or have like an over-parameterized model. Um, but there's a term, it's like a, sort of like a score function term that has expectation zero, so you can remove it. And like David Bly has been talking about this for years, like it's not, not like we invented this trick, we just kind of like <laughs> actually wrote a paper about it. It's like too trivial for David Bly to write a paper about it. Um, but yeah, as we get closer to the true posterior, we call it sticking the landing because you just like get to the true posterior and you're like, shoo, your, your gradients go to zero um, for, the, for the posterior parameters, which is like, I think, really satisfying. So we did a, a, a little extension of that to the SDE setting where it's just like a hierarchy of random variables. And again, there's like a term that you can remove. And so, um, first of all, here I'm on the left, I'm going to show us, here's us sitting a nice multimodal posterior. Uh, we have like Cauchy likelihood on these two data points. So the actual true posterior is bimodal. Um, you know, and there's no, again, even though everything's locally Gaussian, because we're not using linear uh, dynamics functions like in a GP, we can have bimodal non-Gaussian uh, approximate posteriors. And if I just take like two slices here, and show the joints, it's like there's the two modes, right? Um, and here's us reducing the variance of the gradients by like, you know, a factor of like five or 10 by using the sticking the, the landing uh, gradient estimator. Of course, we would need the, the approximate posterior to be like really big to get the variance to go like really close to zero, but that's already like a nice way. So it's like synergy. That's, that's one of the reasons I like this model class. So you're talking about the, yeah, it's like the, Reducing the variance in the gradients, but how do you compute the gradients in the first place? For like, it's it's going to be backward path, I guess. For yeah, yeah. So you have to run the trajectories forward, accumulate all your tails or whatever, get your final likelihoods, and then there's this adjoint uh, yeah. method that runs backwards. And so we actually have this whole paper, scalable ingredients for different or for stochastic differential equations, that just worked out what that adjoint is, yeah. which astoundingly hadn't been done until 2019. And when I'm like. And I found out why, because when I went to the measure theorist at the University of Toronto to say, like, yeah, I think we can like run this SDE backwards and like it'll do the right thing. He was like, what does that even mean? Like you already have this forward filtration, and now you're gonna like also like condition on things again backwards. Like that doesn't make any sense. And I was like, but I wrote this algorithm and it converges. Anyway, he was able to prove that this is a sensible thing to do. Um, but it's not like it didn't exist. It's just the exact same thing as the um ODE adjoint with like an extra term for the noise. I have it in a slide, in my extra slides, so maybe we can talk about it after. But it's exactly what you would guess it is. It's like, um, yeah, so the thing that, one thing I'm excited about is for scientific applications is, remember I said there was this fact that the KL in between uh, these data points is zero. 
uh, at least until you get like up to when it's time to fade in and start thinking about what the next data point is. So why don't we just skip these simulating these trajectories in between? Right? You can imagine having some data about like, let's say, I don't know, you take like an infant's heartbeat and then you're thinking, what's their, if they, you know, what's their uh, heartbeat gonna be like a month from now? If I wanted to compute the joint likelihood, normally I'd have to like actually simulate this trajectory of like a million heartbeats in between. But if I know this stationary distribution, uh, a month from now, I can just skip this because for the KL, I, I know it's zero and just like start estim try to estimate how long it'll take me to like unmix and then sample from the conditional here and just start again. So this is really cool. It's like skipping the boring details and we can do this automatically as long as we can estimate how long it'll take to mix to like fade in. It's kind of like when you have a dream, right? You like dream the important part and then like it can be like a day later in your dream and you somehow come up with like coherent details. Um, like, and again, there has to be like sort of like fade in process there. Um, so that's something that you can totally do. Uh, that is like, I think much nicer than the ODE framework or any of these, uh, well, most parameterizations. And you might say, okay, but you just said you're gonna have some crazy crap for the uh, prior dynamics. It could be like a neural network, um, or sorry, the approximate posterior dynamics. How do we know that it even has a stationary distribution? So, um, oh yeah, I already made that point. So this is, Great paper from Emily Fox that I didn't appreciate back in 2013 that gives the complete recipe for any SDE that has a stationary distribution. It has this form where some of these matrices are like skew symmetric and some of them are, um, I forget uh, what they are. Skew is so skew symmetric and DDs. Uh, yeah, Q is skew symmetric. Wow, you're a physicist, I guess. No, no, no. Okay, well, I'm not <laughs> um, Anyway, and then this H thing, that's this, this, it's kind of just like long-term dynamics with spin is basically what we can parameterize that has a stationary distribution and that stationary distribution, distribution is given by this like energy function H. So as long as we make our approximate posterior um, have this form, we know the stationary distribution and we can restrict it to be something we know how to sample from or, or, or do whatever we want. And if we want, of course, that's boring because now I have this like Markov process and I have to sort of, I might as well just like cut up my data if doesn't, if I'm going to forget what the old data was. But I can also do this uh, in like a two, two tier system where I have my slow variables, which is like, I don't know, the overall like growth of the kid or something, the size of his heart. And then this is like this fast variables, which is like, um, you know, changing every time his heart beats. And this, there's like a nice correspondence between the DAGs and then the SDEs that correspond to those DAGs. And so the point is I can have multiple scales. I have my slow variables that I do actually have to simulate the whole thing. So I'm not memoryless, but it's gonna be cheap because these are very slowly changing. They're gonna have like almost no noise. Um, and then the expensive detailed part, I can just skip when there's no, nothing happening. And so another example I have is like gas, like uh, particles in an inert gas. That would be these like fast changing variables that would be super expensive to simulate. But if I add auxiliary variables to my posterior, that's like temperature and pressure, just like imaginary things, then condition on those, I know what the stationary distribution is. So I can simulate the gas cooling down by just watching the like temperature go down. And then when it's time to make predictions about like, I don't know, mean free path or whatever, I can just like fade back in. Could you learn that? Or would that be something you need to know up front? Well, that's the beautiful part. So you would have to, so this DAG structure thing you'd have to enforce, but the actual dynamics of the latent, of the slow variables and the fast variables, again, I think that can all be jointly learned. Kind of like, like an LSTM sort of architecture almost. Yeah, yeah. But, but basically. Exactly, and we probably would want to use something like an LSTM for the recognition network. Yeah. So anyway, so this is sort of what I'm excited about these days. Um, and oh yeah, that's the fading in. Oh yeah, so then we all, all we need is that the marginal condition on the slow variables has this Emily Fox parameterization. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where I am today. It's like got this new like, uh, model class that I'm playing around with in, and it has its different pros and cons from GPs. Um, and I started trying to figure out like where the biggest bang for our buck is going to be. Um, and yeah, there's Torch and uh, JAX code for this stuff. And now, um, what I, okay, this is, uh, before we get to like the philosophy discussion, I just want to show you. So what I also want to do is like one place where we already have multi-scale stuff with a big payoff is weather simulations. And so we sort of know that you can get a speed up without losing the important information by multi-scale approaches here. 
And I'm saying, okay, I think we can do this all as one giant joint variational SPDE, where all the heuristics that um, whether simulators built by hand will all could in principle just fall out automatically by saying, here's your level of the hierarchy, make it fast and a good approximation to the true weather prior go. Maybe. Um, so yeah, and then this is something that I think is gonna be really fun. And I'm also gonna tease the CBL with. Um, so one of the reasons I think people didn't do the adjoint method for SDEs was because we have so much noise in the forward pass that we have to store for the reverse pass if we want to integrate backwards in time. We have to, in fact, if we're using adaptive solvers, we don't even know where we're going to evaluate this Brownian motion um, on the forward pass. So we have to somehow either store every evaluation we make, um, or what if we could sample an entire Brownian motion in one go? So there was this thing called the Brownian tree that said, oh yeah, we can have a Brownian bridge that like subdivides things. And then sort of me knowing about random seeds said, oh, you can actually uh, specify an entire Brownian tree by just knowing the seed at the root. And uh, the idea is that we condition, we sample the beginning point and the end point of our Brownian motion, then we have a Brownian bridge. And then if I want to evaluate my um, Brownian bridge at some query point, I just subdivide in such a way that I keep track of which branch I'm on in the tree, and then that determines my random seed. And if I do this, then I can zoom in arbitrarily closely to any point here with zero memory. All I have to do is store the seed. And I, again, I have to pay this sort of like log of one over epsilon time cost to zoom in. But if I have like floating point numbers, this is like 64 at most or something, right? So we can sample entire brownie motions like exactly uh, with constant memory. So that means we don't have to store this for the reverse pass. So that, that's like something that doesn't matter that much because it's not that expensive to store the Browning tree. But it does mean that it's just trivial to write your adaptive solvers because the, one of the big problems with SDEs is if I take adaptive SDE solvers, is if I take a step, I have to sample noise. And if I reject that step, I have to still condition on that noise. And people also sample weird integrals of like levy areas and stuff. And so the point is you're never allowed to look at your uh, routing motion sample without memorizing what you saw. So it adds so much complexity to the code. Here, there's just this stateless function that you can query anywhere, and it's all sort of predetermined by the random seed. And the first thing I did on my sabbatical, sorry, I'll get there, is I uh, worked out that you can actually do this in arbitrary dimensions. So here it is a sample from a Brownian sheet, just like a product of Brownian motion kernels. And uh, we can zoom in arbitrarily far, and then we could zoom in go zoom back out, zoom in arbitrarily far somewhere, somewhere else. And like, the point is we never have to decide ahead of time what details to compute. So here's just, uh, I like infinite zoom. And I'm saying like, see, people could do this before, but they could, they could not have done this and then zoom out and like pan and like everything. Oh, sorry. I hit some sort of underflow eventually and I hit the time limit of my. <laughs> anyway, so this is fun. And I think there's some interesting technical questions of like, how much can this be generalized to, for instance, like non Brownian motion sort of stuff? So you, I think you had a question. Yeah, uh, about the Brownian bridge. Yeah. Um, so just to, can you clarify how actually the algorithm works? Like if you run the ODE solver and um, yeah, basically like you, you had, you, you're using adaptive uh, ODE solver, you, you don't well, really know when you, uh, is the solver and uh, you don't really know like where you jump. Exactly. And how actually you reconstruct this from, from this? I mean, I'm not sure, like, they understand. Like, yeah, you have a uh, deterministic algorithm that you, that you see as uh, one and you can reconstruct any path. But mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly the same path that no. you took in your. Exactly. So this is just the input to the integrator, which at every step says, what's my dynamics and what noise am I going to add? Okay. So when it looks at the noise, that's oh, when okay. it calls this as Sorry. a Sorry. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. So I think uh, that's the important stuff I wanted to show you. And I think I'm pretty much out of time. So I was going to show you, I'm working on this in some crazy new dependently typed functional language, which is fun, and uh, sending to jump processes, and then also feeling bad about missing the vote on large language models. That's, all. oh yeah. And um, for, for, for like spicy philosophical debate saying, the main, the thing that made me really love SDEs is I can finally do any marginal transform and like, uh, 
And he's like, Edo's Lama, is that that's still an STD? And I struggled with this a lot. When I was in GP land, I wanted like positive only GPs. And then like a low GP is not a GP. Um, and that was like the big win. But this is really only for single dimensional inputs, right? So it's really only for time series sort of stuff. Cool. That's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much.